information. Um, so another interview that we had. I don't know if we added that this project was completed in 2014. So it has mm -hmm. been three years. And of course, the situation has actually gotten worse. Uh, more um, migrants uh, and asylum seekers are coming uh, to Italy or are trying to use Italy as a transit point to reach other parts of Europe. Um, but yeah, so this project, uh, even though it is about three years old, it's still quite relevant, um, sadly. Mm -hmm. Um, and so another personal story that we had, that we documented was the story of Alachi. So he was a 24 year old um, refugee from Mali and his journey began in Libya where he was working for two years. And after the war broke out, he um, ended up jumping on a, boat, on a boat with many other Africans to seek asylum in Europe. And once he got to Italy, um, he was able to stay there for um, a year in Rome and received all, all of his documents that he needed. And during that time, he was staying in one of the CARA um, reception centers. Um, however, when he got all of his documents, he was unable to find work. And so he has been, um, he's, he's been, um, he has no shelter, he has no food, and, and um, he was able to um, sneak into one of the reception centers with the help of his friends. So he would go to this reception center late at nighttime um, when, like once, once the service providers weren't there. And then early in the morning, he would leave before anyone else was awake. And that was his reality every single day. And, and his story really highlights that despite having all of the documents you need to be, um, in, to be in Italy, to be in Europe, um, you're, still, you're still going to face a lot of challenges. Um, and a lot of this has to do with um, uh, these individuals having challenges with integration and those efforts. And so some of the questions that we wanted to answer is what happens when um, these individuals are pushed to the margins of society? Um, and, and some of the answers that, that we did come up with was that these individuals create their own world uh, within one that may not accept them. They create makeshift communities. And there are so many examples of makeshift communities throughout Europe. And one of the biggest examples that we came across was Salam Palace. And so Salam Palace is an abandoned um, business university on the outskirts of Rome, where over 850 refugees are currently living. So it was broken into in 2006 by six refugees. And um, since then, they have been able to create this world um, inside of this um, space. They have over 800 refugees living there. The palace has over 200 rooms where two to three individuals share. It has its own cafe, its own markets, grocery store, restaurants, and place of worship as well. Um, so, so it really was an intricate world created out of necessity. Um, and they also have a council that runs the house to deal with dis disputes. Um, they have representatives from Somalia, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and, and Sudan on that council. And um, so a lot of the residents living inside this um, place don't even go outside anymore because everything they need is there. Um, and this really makes you question, how do these individuals then integrate into, into Italian society? And this was the mosque that we took a photo of as well. And Salam still exists today. We were there in 2013. Um, and since then, individuals are still living there. And the one, and a lot of refugees actually know about the palace. Um, refugees who don't even live in Salam, in Rome, know about Salam. And, um, and sometimes when they're over capacity, they never turn anyone away. So you end up seeing people sleeping outside on the terrace as well. And there's many families that live there um, and people from those countries. And that's just one example of a makeshift community that we came across. Another one was uh, Comunita La Pace, Community of Peace. Um, and this one was an, out, an outdoor makeshift community. So they have no electricity and no water. Um, and about 100 refugees live here from Tunisia, from Morocco, um, and again, have created their own world. And what's really interesting is that looking at the names, so Community of Peace and Salam Palace, meaning Peace Palace, um, this really shows you that these individuals are trying to send a message saying that we, we all come in peace, which is very interesting for us when we, when we went there. So to go back to our 
properly. So again, after the asylum, I think one of our biggest conclusions from this project was that Italy really does not have a long-term integration process um, in terms of dealing with the refugee crisis. And, um, the, re and the, reality that awaits for the, um, the reality that awaits these refugees is very different than what's, um, what's on paper in terms of how refugees are supposed to be um, protected and integrated into, into society. Um, however, I wanted to end off with a positive story about what happens when refugees are given an opportunity to integrate. So um, these individuals are part of Barikama yogurts. Barikama means um, resistance, and it's a micro-income project that was created by five young refugees uh, from Mali, and they make and sell yogurts throughout Europe, and they've been learning the language through, through this program. Um, so these men were actually part of the Rosarno Revolt in 2010. They were, um, they were being abused on the farming fields there um, and, and having a lot of disputes with the locals um, and, and were also subject um, to attacks by locals. And so once they left, they ended up in Rome and they got in touch with an NGO that, was actually, um, that actually helped them create um, this project, um, and I actually visited them last April. So um, they were working outside of an abandoned textile factory before, um, but my last visits um, in April, uh, they've got a new uh, commercial building, and they've been able to hire more African refugees as well. And this program really um, allows them to integrate um, through society because they're learning the language, they're creating community connections, they're delivering yogurts all throughout Italy on a bicycle. So. I think this is one of the positive examples of, of what happens when these individuals are, are given an opportunity. So uh, the, the next project that we're gonna use as a comparison is one that uh, we worked on in Canada. Uh, so because we're, we're Canadians, um, I think we know our immigration system a lot better than, uh, than we know the uh, Italian or the European. Uh, asylum system, uh, but, and I understand that uh, there, are, there will be people who say you can't possibly compare Italy and Canada. Um, Canada has a comprehensive welfare system like some of the northern European countries uh, and it's difficult to compare that to a country like Italy that really that's, doesn't exist. Um, Canadians pay high taxes, um, but you know, as a result of that, they're able to get uh, universal health care and access a lot of uh, programs and services. Um, the other argument that can be made is that, well, you look at where Italy is geographically located. Um, how can you compare that to a country like Canada where you're not really concerned about um, the influx of uh, um, migrants and refugees. But I think there is uh, a, an area that we can compare, and that is uh, what Asha was speaking about before, which is long-term uh, integration. Uh, so we'll start by uh, showing you a three-minute clip uh, of this uh, documentary that we worked on, um, and then hopefully we can talk about uh, 19 Days, which is the uh, film that uh, we completed uh, in last year, in 2016. Hopefully the internet doesn't fail us today. Yeah, family of two and uh, uh, the family of two and uh, also the family of four from Syria. طيب انا شايف انه في حد كتب لك حاجه بعد الاشياء طيب اسمك محمد عبد العرب اوكي مراد عبد العرب انت قعدت في معسكر لاجين لا لا اوكي صحتك ازاي صحتك النفسيه البدنيه في عندي ظهري في عندي تقرير وفي عندي دوالي عندي تقارير كنت بدي اعمل عمل يعني خالص اوراقي لين عندي مرحله واصل اخر مرحله انت بتاخذ ادويه دلوقتي 
هل الماء بس ظهري مرات واخذ له بتاخذ اي ادويه بتاعت المسكنات بس اوكي مسكنات اوكي بين كيلرز اوكي وصحتك العقليه ازاي؟ عقلك تمام 100% كنت اراجع الدكتور بسوريا عقليا؟ ايه كنت نفسيا اه حالات نفسيه؟ اه انما في حاجه بتحكي معك بتقول لك حاجات بتسمع صوت؟ لا لا حد يعني ضربك او غصبك عليك حاجه وحطوك في السجن يعني شفت حاجه زي مشاكل يعني؟ ايه اه في في العراق؟ سوريا في سوريا طيب انت تعرضت على السجن وضربوك وعمل فيك حاجه؟ لا لا صحتك العقليه ازاي؟ والله عقلتي عند هذا بس يصح لا انت انا بسالك انت انت صحتك العقليه ازاي دلوقتي؟ ابني اولادك؟ مم. اوكي طيب انما كده انت مش مجنون بس انت عايز يعني حنين على ابنك عايز تعرف حاله حيكون ازاي؟ طيب انت حتقعوا هتكون هنا في مده 19 يوم حني كلمك عن اولا هيدوك مستشير ده هيكون بيتك الاولاني وده بيقولوه مارجر تشيسم ريسيتر من سنتر اسمع احنا كل جايتنا من لهون مشان نعالج الولد احنا كل جايتنا لهون مشان نعالج الولد اه ليه بقى انتوا مش عايزين تبقوا هنا لا نحن يعني انه طمعتنا نحن بالجاي كلها مشان اه علشان نلاقي يعني دكاتره احسن وعلاج احسن لا 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 م. عمليه عمليه ايه آه. عنده آه. لابد يعمل عمليه ايه مين اللي قال الكلام ده؟ دكتور اللي هناك في لبنان ايه هو ابنك يحتاج عمليه يحتاج عمليه طيب لما رحتوا من المستشفى النهارده الفحص اللي عمله بس تحاليل دم فقط بس بس ما فيش اشعاعات ولا الترا ساوند ولا حاجه زي كده لا 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 طيب المفروض يعمل عمليه فين في جسمه زرع مخاع مشان الدم في رجعه بدي ارجع فيه ترجع فين يا اخوي ترجع وين ما برجع برجع انا كل جيتي مشان عمليته عايز ترجع من هنا تروح فين اذا ما على جولي برجع عايز تروح فين ما بعرف وين ما هذا بروح. كل صبر جميل انتظر شوي نشوف ايه اللي هيحصل، اوكي؟ لسه بدري ما نعرفش يا دوبك كم يوم انت موجود هنا؟ ثلاث ايام ثلاث ايام ها؟ وعمر وراكم عندكم عائلة صغيرة وعندكم أولاد وكل حاجة حيكون إن شاء الله تمام، اوكي؟ ما تقلقش. كل واحد لما جه هنا زي كده شوية كان الآن من البداية لأنه رحت مكان ما تعرفش خالص. بعد ما تقعد شوية وتلاقي أصحابك ناس من سوريا كانت بتعرفهم ولا ما كنتش بتعرفهم ويكون معك أصحاب وتكون معك سكن وكل حاجة وأنت تلاقي عمل هتكون أحسن من المكان اللي كنت موجود بكثير لأنه في مستقبل هنا لأولادك وليك أنت وين ما دام So that center that you saw there is called the Margaret Chills Home Resettlement Center um, it is one of many uh, reception houses uh, throughout the country, uh, but what makes this one unique in particular is um, that it was built and designed in the form of a house, um, whereas the other reception centers can be public buildings, facilities, things like that. Um, and so they, um, they thought that if you build it to look like a house, and that possibly, um, if it looks like a house and feels like a house, then it will help refugee families transition a lot easier um, to Canadian society. Uh, and I think that, that that's a very interesting point since our experience there was that in the in on the inside, it very much feels like a reception house. The staff work um, upstairs and the families live uh, in the downstairs area. So for the last 24 years, uh, this house in a quiet neighborhood uh, in Calgary um, has received over 11,000 refugees. Um, at any time, they can accommodate up to 70 um, refugees. Um, and they will stay up to 19 days. And I know that's a bit of a strange number, and, and I'll explain that um, after. 
Um, but this house has been witness to various migration tragedies throughout the years, from the conflict uh, in Bosnia to Rwanda to Somalia and to Syria today. Um, so during points in history, you will see more people from one country um, staying at the house. Uh, so this 19-day timeline, this center is run by a local uh, non-governmental organization called Calgary Catholic Immigration Society. They are funded by the federal government. And so in discussion with the government, they came to an agreement that um, the, when refugees land in our city, that initial first few weeks, they need a place to stay, they need an orientation, they need support and then we can help them transition to long-term uh, um, accommodation. So during, they agreed that uh, 19 days is all it took for these families to have an introduction to Canadian society. And so during this period, they pick them up from the airport. There is uh, an immigration loan for the, uh, sorry, an airplane loan. Uh, so the government pays for the tickets that these families come on. But the expectation is that the families, when they get on their feet, will pay uh, that back. Um, so then they arrive at this house. Um, they stay for three weeks. Uh, and during this process, they can, the counselors will conduct a needs assessment, like you saw in that uh, um, interview that was happening. They find out about the family. Um, they find out what those needs are, if there are any medical things that are going on, any mental health issues. Uh, and then during this time, they also have different workshops on the education system in Canada, on the health system. They help them get their health care cards, um, apply for different types of documents. Uh, and then they, are, um, they help them find uh, permanent um, apartments to rent or houses. Whatever the family size is, uh, they will help them find housing that is appropriate for them. And so... The support doesn't actually stop there. Um, Government-sponsored refugees uh, in Canada are supported, financially supported by the government for one year. Um, so the first uh, few weeks they spend in this house, but for when they find them permanent accommodation, for one year they will help them with the rent, um, the different bills. Uh, the amount that they are given really isn't very much. It is comparable to um, those who are on social assistance or welfare. So it is very, very basic. They're not getting lavish apartments and cars and things like that. It's very uh, basic. And for families that come in larger sizes, like six, eight members, that can be difficult to find them even a place to live um, because, again, it's based on how big the family is and Certain landlords won't let you live in a three-bedroom house or apartment if you are a family of six. So the asylum, if you just go back, the asylum system in Canada is made up of two parts. Uh, the first one I talked about right now, which is the resettlement program for those who apply outside of Canada. So they spent time in refugee camps and then they apply to come to Canada and uh, they go through that process. The other group I'm going to speak about is uh, refugee claimants, which is similar to what Italy is going through in terms of asylum seekers. Th these are people who arrive to the country and then seek asylum and seek um, uh, and want to stay as a refugee. Uh, just a quick fact. So since November 2015, Canada has accepted 40, 40, around 40,000 um, Syrian refugees. And these are just Syrian refugees. So of course, the government is accepting refugees from other parts of the world, but in part of their uh, responsibility to what is happening in Syria, that was the promise that they uh, had made. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, government-assisted refugees, they find support not just from this organization that, uh, that um, you know, will help them with the orientation process, help them learn about life in Canada, but also uh, the community supports them. So this is neighborhoods, churches, um, friends. Um, the community really plays, I think, a large role in supporting the families that are settled uh, in their communities. So refugee claimants, that's the closest, or, or that's the example that we can give you. Um, 
in comparison to what Italy is going through. Uh, just a few numbers. In 2014, more than 13,500 people came to Canada um, and made an asylum claim. Uh, in 2015, that number jumped up to 16,900. Um, in 2016, that was 17,500. And in the first two months of, or sorry, in the first two months of this year, 5,520 people made refugee claims in Canada. So I'm sure you all know what significant events happened in January. Is there anyone who does not know? So the inauguration of the American president uh, happened in January. Mm -hmm. And so since then, just in the first two months, this is a very large number of refugees coming from the United States. And that's something that I think you know, uh, the US and Canada never thought they would have to experience refugees from these developed leading nations. Um, and it's interesting because if you want to, oh, and just a quick thing about, go back, uh, about, thank you, about refugee claimants. Uh, so I want to stress that they are really eligible for very limited resources. And it's because they came to Canada either on a work visa or on vacation or whatever reason, and then when it expired, they claimed asylum. So the government doesn't really reward people for doing that. And so the support they get is very, very minimal and very bare, but they do have access to legal aid. They can get work permits after a certain number of months that they spend in Canada. And they may be eligible for some kind of social assistance because you know, it's, it's, it's inhumane to allow someone to not have anything. So, um, but refugee claimants in Canada, their, their process does take a long time. Um, it, it won't be surprising for it to take two, three, four years um, for them to be granted permanent status. Uh, but during this time, they are still able to be part of some kind of community um, in their country, in Canada. Uh, they're able to um, connect with the community, and I think that, that that's important. Um, so back to um, refugees from the U.S. Uh, so our news has been flooded with these stories uh, for the last, since the beginning of the year. Uh, asylum seekers coming from... Uh, the U.S. to uh, provinces like Manitoba, Quebec, uh, and British Columbia. And these uh, asylum seekers are individuals who claimed asylum in the U.S. and was either rejected or they were still going through that process and they just felt that, well, the way Donald Trump is going right now with the travel ban and with all the other stuff that he's doing, chances are I probably won't get asylum here. So they take the risk uh, and come to Canada. And they're doing this, next slide please, uh, in minus 20 degree weather, because we do have winter in Canada for a large part. Uh, and these, uh, the asylum seekers started coming to Canada in December. And so in freezing temperatures, they uh, were willing to risk um, their health and their lives. Uh, to claim asylum. And similar to the Dublin regulation that you have uh, in Europe, we have something called a safe third country agreement with the United States. So in 2004, the two countries signed this agreement saying that if asylum seekers apply for asylum in one of the countries, they cannot do it in the other. Um, and so if these, uh, if the asylum seekers had taken le legal routes uh, to come to Canada and they had crossed the border at the points where there are the check stops, um, they would have been turned back because they had an asylum process going on uh, in the US. So what they're doing is they're taking illegal routes to come to Canada, so similar to what you see uh, happening in Europe. Um, and they're doing this in, in in crazy temperatures. So there were cases of asylum seekers losing fingers and their hands because of the frostbite that they endured um, 
making their way uh, to Canada. And so it shows you the, the fear that they felt, that they would be willing to risk that. Um, but at the moment, because we have the safe third country agreement, it's going to be really difficult for them to, to try and claim um, asylum, even if you know, they were rejected uh, in the US. So uh, they are projecting that upwards of 33,000 um, refugee claimants we will have by the end of the year, uh, which is almost 40% more. If you want to go back. No, um, not, not just from the US. So those numbers uh, that I gave, uh, the 5,520 number that I gave, those were refugee claimants in general. About half of that, so around 2,000, were from the U.S. So, I mean, that, that's still a large number, and if it does jump to 33,000 by the end of the year, I'm sure a large number of that will be from uh, the United States. Uh, and so uh, that's what uh, the country is currently going through. Uh, but the comparison that I really wanted to make uh, between Italy and Canada is that while there's so many differences, uh, Canada has a pathway to citizenship that I, from my experience, I don't think I have heard about that or seen that through uh, our time in Italy. Uh, so anyone that comes to Canada, um, whether they are a refugee who's granted asylum or they're a refugee claimant who is waiting out their process, once the country does give you a permanent asylum and you can stay, you have an opportunity to become a Canadian citizen. And there are certain requirements uh, that that needs to happen uh, in order to become a citizen. So you need to have spent time in Canada. And right now it's about four out of six years you need to be living in Canada in order to apply. You need to have adequate knowledge of one of the first, or sorry, one of the official languages, English or French. Um, you need to write a Canadian citizenship exam, which is a knowledge test about Canada's history, government, etc. You need to have filed your taxes, and of course, you need to have not committed any crimes in or outside of Canada. That can affect whether they are um, given citizenship or not. But I think this is important because in Italy, I understand that it's very difficult to get citizenship if you're a foreigner. I also understand that the second generation uh, children of immigrants don't even have their citizenship in many cases. And these are people who were born in, the U uh, in Italy and they know... Hi. Sorry. Uh, it's exactly the same in Italy. We have a path, but the only difference is that we don't have the use solely. So until kids that were born in Italy are 18 years old, they can get citizenship. After 18 years old, they can apply for citizenship. But I we exactly have, uh, um, we must have like 10 years spent in Italy. We must have uh, exactly the same. I understand. <laughs> thank you. Sorry. For, no, thank you for that. Um, we did speak with, uh, um, young Italians who, whose parents came as migrants who live in Italy who are over 18 and still don't have their citizenship because they did apply, but of course things take time, right? And uh, I think sometimes on paper things look very easy and that they look like there's a steps that you take, but in reality I'm sure there's some barriers that they are facing. The young individual we spoke with did apply for his citizenship, Italian citizenship, and it's taking a long time for him. So again, I think that, um, and it's similar with Canada. We have this, um, everything is on paper here, the steps, but everyone is different. Everyone has different circumstances. It may be difficult for them to, to get that. Um, but, so, but my observation was that if the second generation um, uh, Italians are, having trouble becoming part of Italian society, what do you expect from people that come as asylum seekers and as refugees? Um, so although I agree with you, there may be both countries have this process, I think that 
the thing with Canada is that it is a country of immigrants. Um, it's hard to look at one face and say that's a Canadian face uh, because we are so diverse. And I, I want to make a suggestion that why in many ways, and this is my opinion, but why Italy has been treating the refugee crisis and the migration um, uh, phenomenon as an emergency for over 15 years now uh, is because they believe that these people would eventually go home. When it got better, they would return home. I'd like, I would love to know if Italians believe that there is a permanent place in Italian society for these people. Can there be an Italian citizen with a black face? Can there be? And I, I'm sure there are people who will say yes, but your government may not say that. So what's in, I mean, that may be controversial, but our experience has been that uh, it, Italian society is quite homogenous, and for that reason, I wonder if there is a permanent place in Italian society for uh, foreigners. And if there is, then when will this, uh, the migration crisis stop being treated as an emergency? And when will these people be considered as people that may not return home and may stay and can become permanently part of Italian society? So it, in my experience, that's the, the difference, is that I feel in Canada there's a very clear pathway to citizenship. Um, but I, I would love to hear your thoughts on uh, whether you agree with that or not. So uh, just very briefly, uh, we want to open it up to some more questions. We'll just touch on uh, our experiences and the role of journalists when you're, for example, um, working with refugees uh, and dealing with um, uh, issues related to um, the global migration crisis. So how many journalists do we have in the room? by a show of hands. Great, so we just wanted to share some of the important points that we learned um, documenting the migration crisis. And I think, firstly, it's important to understand the trauma and the consequences of the migration journey when we're covering these stories. Um, and as we've shown you through our work, there are multiple narratives of the refugee crisis. Uh, for the film that Rhoda showed you, 19 Days, we have families from Syria in the house, we have families from Burundi, families from uh, Sudan, who all have different migration experiences. Some have lived their whole lives in refugee camps. Others were, were refugees in cities. Um, some of them came, um, came uh, looking for a new opportunity, while others have to take care of their families back home. So I think it's very important to acknowledge um, that there are more than one refugee story, and that's why we wrote um, 65.3 million stories, uh, which is currently the, the migration crisis number of how many displaced people there are in the world, and understanding that each story is different, and that as, as journalists, we, we cannot define these individuals in numbers and, and, and statistics as well. So that was one of the points we wanted to make. Another point is um, the importance of follow-up, so making sure that you share your story with the individuals that you interviewed. You actually share your story with the community, um, you know, because, uh, because they, they want to see your work, they want to um, understand the story, and I think it's also important because it, it allows you to go back to the story. As, as, as time goes, people's lives change and their experience changes as well, so I think it's so important to follow up because these individuals um, aren't going to be in the same place. Uh, for example, with Bari Kama, I, I visited them last April after three years, and now um, their, their um, yogurt company is more successful. They've hired more African refugees um, working there, so that's one of the important points we wanted to make. And another point which, um, which I think is also important is that stories don't end. You know, right when we turn our tape recorder off or, or um, turn our camera off, and that was a lesson that I learned from an Afghan asylum seeker about four years ago. And um, he actually changed my life. He actually changed the way I approach journalism um, because he actually refused to, uh, to, um, in to um, let me interview him. He was saying that I was like every other journalist. You know, I was here for his story today, but tomorrow I would be on my next story while well, it was still his reality. And I think it's so important for us to, to understand that as well. Is there anything you all? 
Um, I think that you covered it. And, and you know, our system in Canada is not perfect. That's a large part of why we wanted to make the film the 19 Days, uh, is because as Canadians, we know that uh, newcomers come to our country, but we don't necessarily know what happens after. Uh, and so for us, a huge or a large part of this project uh, was the educational piece um, so that Canadians can get an inside look into what life in a resettlement center looks like. Uh, because in order for us to create more inclusive and supportive um, uh, uh, environments for newcomers, we have to understand what they're going through. Uh, and that's what we tried to show uh, in 19 days. So before we get to questions, I just wanted to show you guys a, a clip of Barikama yogurts um, and these incredible, this incredible story. Abbiamo cominciato così da 15 litri. Andando avanti e facendo mercati e consegni e conoscendo le persone ci siamo cresciuti la vendita. Fino adesso siamo a 150 litri diciamo. Il nome del progetto è da tanto che ci pensiamo come dovrebbe essere. Però poi abbiamo deciso, a un certo punto abbiamo deciso di chiamare il progetto Yogurt Barikama, perché Barikama vuol dire in Bambara resistente. Quindi resistente non è per la forza, ma è, è, vuol dire è resiste perché andrà avanti vuole dire quello so that was just a little clip and all of our projects are available online um, for free so 19 days is online um, the full film and living at the border as well um, we want to make sure that um, our content is accessible to audiences because we hope to educate people and to really expand um, their world and the conversations that we're currently having and now we'll open it up to any questions or comments that you may have. Okay, I'll start. Okay. Uh, thanks for a very interesting presentation and uh, comparing and contrasting the two situations. Uh, my uh, question is, relates to Canada. Um, like, as we know that you know, uh, there's a sort of hierarchy of the countries that have to carry the highest refugee burdens, and they tend to be the poorer they are, the more of a burden they carry. So you've got, you know, uh, the immediate neighbors of a conflict zone carry the highest burden. So in the case of um, Syria, you've got Lebanon, Jordan, so on, carrying, and Turkey carrying a huge burden. In the case of Yemen, you've got the Horn of Africa carrying a huge burden, and so on and so forth. Uh, whereas Canada, even though Justin Trudeau has, has opened up the gates a little bit, bears one of the smallest burdens in the world per, you know, per capita, even though its land mass is probably it's the second largest in the world, as far as I'm aware. It's a very, very rich country. So why isn't it doing more? What, why isn't it? accepting instead of 10 or 15,000 or 20,000, 100,000 or 200,000 refugees. 
Your question is why isn't Canada accepting? So, so um, when the new government was called, they had said in one year they would take uh, 30,000 Syrian refugees. Um, that number is at 40 now, 40,000, and I know that they're not actually stopping there. There's even a link um, to the government website that tells you as of this day, this is how many refugees uh, have been accepted. So I know there is still a commitment from the Canadian government uh, to uh, continue accepting um, refugees. Our population size, if you compare it to the land mass that we have, I, I think Canada needs newcomers and Canadians acknowledge that. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I think that uh, they are, they have plans to accept more. Um, we don't always like to compare ourselves to the South, our southern neighbors, but we are accepting more than the U.S. is. So, uh, and I think now with some of the changes in American politics and government, we'll be seeing uh, an, an increase uh, there. But I agree with you 100% that these countries like Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, Kenya, th these are where the largest refugee camps are in the world. Um, but these countries are not, are not really complaining, right? Most complaints we hear are from Europe and other parts where they are talking about the numbers of people that are coming in and it's a, it's a burden and they're, the European Union is talking about burden sharing and which country should be responsible for what. Uh, but, as you said, the countries that are really the ones carrying um, the, the refugees, they're really not, I don't, they're not complaining that much. Do you have anything to add to that? I think another challenge is proximity. Again, let's say Lebanon and Yemen and, and those countries are, are, are closest to the conflict, whereas in Canada now, um, we're very far away and, and disconnected and away from the issue. But Canada can, can do more, I think, in terms of accepting more refugees. Um, thank you very much for the, this nice presentation. And um, my question goes out to you and actually everybody in this room because I'm from Switzerland and as we know, Switzerland is kind of um, on the way for uh, people traveling north to Germany or Sweden. And because of the Dublin um, contract, many, I, I would say several thousand people get deported from Switzerland back to Italy or are refused directly at the border and sent back to Italy. So um, I was wondering if you or anyone else knows what happened to the people who get deported from European countries back to Italy because what I heard is that they are denied um, access to the CARA structures, that a lot of them just end up sleeping on the streets. Um, I heard there's supposed to be special accommodations for families or women traveling alone or um, accompanied by their children, but um, there are rumors that these structures don't really exist. So right now I'm starting a research in the case of one Somali woman who's supposed to be sent back to Italy and we have the strong um, sus suspicion that the structure that she's supposed to go in, um, in Puglia doesn't exist. So I, I was wondering what your experiences were. Thank you so much for that question. Um, during our time documenting the stories, we actually met people who were sent back from Germany, from France, um, and the challenge is that Italy's facing a backlog because there's, again, people are continuing um, to come to Italy from from North Africa. So, so the challenge is that when these individuals get sent back, Italy's also dealing with all of the other pro, um, processes for the other refugees that are coming. So um, like that's, I think that's one of the challenges they face in terms of, of allowing them back into the CARA system. Um, Rhoda, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, we're pretty much uh, says that we're out of time. But yeah, you're exactly right. Um, when they are returned to Italy, for example, they've lost their spot, their place mm -hmm. in the reception center. So you will see them, for example, in Rome, lined up at night to sleep by Termini Station, uh, simply because they, they've lost their place. Uh, and so, yeah, what is on paper and what is in actually happening in reality, I think, is, is very different. Uh, and so, all the best with your research. So, yeah, we're, we're out of time, but we'll, 
we'll be around outside if anybody has any individual questions. Thank you again so much for being here. Yes, for sure. of his documents that he needed and during that time he was staying in one of the Kara um, reception centers um, however when he got all of his documents he was unable to find work and so he has been um, he's he's been um, he has no shelter he has no food and and um, he was able to um, sneak into one of the reception centers with the help of his friends so he would go to this reception center late at night time um, when like once, once the service providers weren't there, and then early in the morning he would leave before anyone else was awake, and that was his reality every single day. And and his story really highlights that, despite having all of the documents you need to be um, in to be in Italy, to be in Europe, um, you're still you're still going to face a lot of challenges, um, and a lot of this has to do with. Um, uh, these individuals having challenges with integration and those efforts. And so some of the questions that we wanted to answer is what happens when um, these indigenous... Um, so another interview that we had. I don't know if we added that this project was completed in 2014. So it has been mm -hmm. three years. And of course, the situation has actually gotten worse. Uh, more um, migrants uh, and asylum seekers are coming uh, to Italy or are trying to use Italy as a transit point to reach other parts of Europe. Um, but yeah, so this project, uh, even though it is about three years old, it's still quite relevant, um, sadly. Mm -hmm. Um, and so another personal story that we had, that we documented, was the story of Alachi. So he was a 24-year-old um, refugee from Mali, and his journey began in Libya, where he was working for two years. And after the war broke out, he um, ended up jumping on a boat on a boat with many other Africans to seek asylum in Europe. And once he got to Italy, um, he was able to stay there for um, a year in Rome and received all. All he was an intricate world created out of necessity. Um, and they also have a council that runs the house to deal with dis disputes. Um, they have representatives from Somalia, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and, and Sudan on that council. And um, so a lot of the residents living inside this um, place don't even go outside anymore because everything they need is there. Um, and this really makes you question, how do these individuals then integrate into, into Italian society? And this was the mosque that we took a photo of as well. And Salam still exists today. We were there in 2013. Um, and since then, individuals are still living there. And the one, and a lot of refugees actually know about the palace. Um, refugees who don't even live in Salam, in Rome, know about Salam. And, um, and sometimes when they're over capacity, they never turn anyone away. So you end up seeing people sleeping outside on the terrace as well. And there's many families that live there um, and people from those countries. And that's just one example of a makeshift community that we came across. Another one was uh, Community La Pace, Community of Peace. Um, and this one was an, out, an outdoor makeshift community. So they have no electricity and no water. Um, and about 100 refugees live here from Tunisia, from Morocco, um, and again, have created their own world. And what's really interesting is that looking at the names, so Community of Peace and Salam Palace, meaning Peace Palace, um, this really shows you that these individuals are trying to send a message saying that we, we all come in peace, which is very interesting for us when we, when we went there. And so to go. Individuals are pushed to the margins of society. Um, and, and some of the answers that, that we did come up with was that 
these individuals create their own world uh, within one that may not accept them. They create makeshift communities. And there are so many examples of makeshift communities throughout Europe. And one of the biggest examples that we came across was Salam Palace. And so Salam Palace is an abandoned um, business university on the outskirts of Rome, where over 850 refugees are currently living. So it was broken into in 2006 by six refugees. And um, since then, they have been able to create this world um, inside of this um, space. They have over 800 refugees living there. The palace has over 200 rooms where two to three individuals share. It has its own cafe, its own markets, grocery store, restaurants, and place of worship as well. Um, so, so it really.